Well, uh, hi again, everyone, and hello to the new people that have joined for this last session. Uh, I'm Patrick Murphy. I am the Director of Sustainable Design with Vanderwaal Engineers and also the uh, resident engineer on the BSA SCUP committee. So uh, for those of you that have, have participated in the previous two sessions here this afternoon, um, you'll have seen a discussion about health and wellness design, uh, kind of as a design philosophy and strategies and, and research that goes into that. You've also seen the engineering side of um, health and wellness design, especially around HVAC systems, and especially in relation to the, the pandemic that we're all going through. But now we want to wrap up with a case study of a project that's in construction now, um, hoping to open later this year, that actually takes a lot of these, these best practices and, uh, you know, brings them to reality. Uh, now, this is an interesting case study because it's not only about the design of the building, but also the owner engagement um, and how we as a planning community can also work with our universities and college um, partners to implement uh, policies to use our projects as a catalyst for larger um, health and wellness uh, initiatives on campus. So I'm uh, pleased to introduce our two presenters. Um, full disclosure, I was a part of this project uh, as well, but uh, our architect is uh, Scott Liebau from HGA uh, here in Boston, and our sustainability uh, project manager from Vanderweil is Gabrielle Henkels. So with that, I'll let you uh, share, the Scott, share the screen, Scott, and uh, get take it away. I will be putting a link in the chat for uh, everyone to fill out for a continuing education. If you have already filled out the, the link from the previous sessions, you need to fill this one out as well for the third session. Um, I'll put it in there a couple of times. And uh, if there are questions that come up in the chat, you know, we'll be monitoring that and we'll have some time at the end for, for questions. All right, take it away, Scott. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, just a, a quick note for um, Gabrielle, I am unable to give you share control with you, so I will be doing all the slides, um, just so when you're clicking next slide and it's not working, you'll know why. Great, thank um, you. <clears throat> um, but anyway, uh, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, all for uh, attending, and thank you to, to the BSA and, and SCUP for inviting us to present. Uh, to present the HST. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the case study uh, for Lehigh's new uh, health science technology building um, has a, uh, this will be, is the topic, um, it's gonna have a specific focus on health and wellness strategies that were implemented into the project and uh, how those strategies fit into and inform Lehigh's overall campus goals. Um, and we can jump past here because Patrick just introduced us. Um, the, so uh, you know, just taking a quick look at the agenda, um, we have four primary sort of topics of discussion. Uh, the, the, real, the real meat of it is in three and four. That's what we're really here about today. Um, one thing I would like to point out though, as we, as we, um, we sort of placed uh, discussion points within what might be considered a sort of a primary topic, but you'll notice as we go through this presentation, there's, a, there's sort of a lot of overlap between um, these uh, wealth, health and wellness strategies that we uh, implemented. Um, and so just, just keep an eye out for that. Um, this is a, an AIA accredited presentation. So uh, if you're an architect looking for CEUs, this is good for one uh, HSW. And um, I will just go quickly through a, sort of a project uh, overview. Uh, <clears throat> And to just give you um, uh, some some context, uh, you know, about the building, um, Lehigh University is located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. For anyone who is unaware, uh, and it is about 300 miles southwest of Boston, and uh, or um, you know, a 90-minute drive south of Philadelphia. Uh, the HST uh, is part of a new campus vision. Uh, plan that HGA helped develop in an earlier study done with the president's office. Uh, out of that study, various needs were identified. 
um, among them and one, and one of the more, more immediate needs was a new state-of-the-art research building, um, and you know, hence the, the, the health science and technology building. Um, you know, just you see some quick highlights here. You know, it's about 190,000 square feet, five floors of, of research, um, various, uh, you know, energy and biohealth is really the focus, uh, the focus uh, themes for the, for the day one um, uh, fit out. And, um, you know, there's also a characterization suite uh, in the basement. And um, we're hoping to uh, open in September of, uh, of this year. Um, in planning the HST with Lehigh, uh, one, of the, one of the first steps um, that the project team worked on was really to establish project goals. Um, many, many were discussed. It was a, uh, you know, a, a very sort of collaborative conversation. Um, some even having sub goals. Looming all of them over, looming over all of them though really was um, the president's desire to reestablish Lehigh uh, amongst the top tier engineering institutions in the country. Um, they had kind of fallen in rankings a little bit and were looking to, to, re, uh, to, to um, reposition themselves, uh, but also to attract and retain the best educators and research faculty and to entice you know, the best students to, um, to, attend, Le, uh, to attend Lehigh. Um, you know, the, the takeaways, you know, listed here are kind of captured, I think, what I consider to be the primary goals. Um, the, the, this, this sort of figure plan on the, on the left shows uh, the HST, which is um, uh, the, the green building uh, in the purple field of, of context. Um, they, this is at the very north west, northeast corner of the campus, and they wanted um, um, uh, uh, abutting um, res what's primarily residential neighborhoods and wanted to create uh, an open inviting face uh, a new gateway um, to, to the campus uh, from that community. Uh, they also needed to, uh, they also needed a new technological capability. All of Lehigh's existing research facilities are, are rather dated um, and, and, uh, and just don't meet the performance needs required by modern research tools and equipment uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, they also want to encourage collaboration, uh, break down department, uh, the departmental walls historically, not unlike uh, a lot of uh, academic institutions, um, they operate um, in, in, de in departments and they're kind of looking to break away from that and go with a more modern approach uh, to research uh, in academia, which is to be um, interdisciplinary. And, the other key thing here, and, and it's uh, uh, interesting given the, uh, the, the, you know, the pandemic that we currently find ourselves in is that in 2018, they launched a brand new College of Health. They hired their inaugural dean uh, and, the H and the HST would become the home for, for the College of Health. Um, and of course, they also want to make it sustainable. Um, and with uh, and clearly, you know, today's discussion on health and wellness uh, uh, falls under that umbrella. So before we jump into the health and wellness design, we wanted to touch on some of the project sustainability highlights. So we are pursuing <clears throat> LEED Gold certification and FitWell three star certification, which is the highest level for FitWell. We're actually earning, um, or we're targeting over 90% of the FitWell strategies available, and we're past the three-star threshold even. On the sustainability side, we are um, seeing a 45% energy savings from the lead baseline with neutral temperature air system paired with chilled beams and energy recovery. We're also achieving a 76% water reduction with a water reclamation system and through the use of air-cooled chillers on site. And our EUI for the building is shaping up to be 132 um, kilo BTUs per square foot per year. And we can compare that to the I2SL baseline of 304 kBTU per square foot per year. Go ahead and do next slide, Scott. Oh, sorry. It's okay, I'll say next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, 
as uh, previously mentioned, uh, the, the, the site is located at the very northeast uh, corner of the campus, abutting residential neighborhoods. Um, this is a uh, site plan of the, of the, the new landscape. It's a uh, former, uh, very large parking lot. Um, the, this, uh, for this landscape was prepared by, uh, designed by Sasaki. So this is their rendering. Um, just wanted to give them credit for that. Um, but historically the Lehigh campus um, which is, you know, to the southwest uh, uh, from, from the building uh, has been in, inward facing. Um, but one of the project goals, uh, uh, as sort of previously noted, was to really uh, to engage the community. Um, part of Lehigh's mission, and particularly that of the College of Health, is to integrate with that local community at a higher and, and more personal level. Um, as such, the former parking lot site will be transformed into an open and inviting pedestrian friendly landscape. Um, there are two entry lobbies uh, in the, on the north side of the building. At the top of the slide, you can see the arrow, the two red arrows, uh, those are the primary lobbies. Uh, they're public facing, they're very, uh, they're all um, structurally glazed curtain wall, fully transparent. And those space, those lobbies have been uh, sort of oversized and designed um, to be large multifunction spaces where community events can be held. And um, we'll see um, a little bit actually uh, Gabriella's background is actually the, the northeast uh, lobby. Uh, so that gives you a sense of what the, those the spaces are sort of like. Uh, the building part T itself, as you can see in the top left corner, is really it's composed of two interlocking L's with the lab program loaded in the north and east bars, the non-lab functions in the south and west. The, the green areas that you see in the, in the axon are the, um, are the labs. Uh, the lab programs and the office uh, and the orange areas are office and work areas and the purple spaces you see are amenity spaces like uh, conference rooms, break rooms, um, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is a view uh, looking at the north face of the building. Uh, so from a programmatic standpoint, because the labs are more um, sort of private and secure and have uh, need different levels of light control, um, this, the, these functions uh, allowed us to form somewhat of a sort of a hard edge uh, at the, uh, uh, along the, the public streetscape. Uh, we used um, terracotta panels to create sort of an axler pattern that was um, reminiscent of a lot of the uh, stone uh, buildings that uh, are in the context of Lehigh's campus. And it also anchors that corner, really sort of establishing that, that gateway piece. Um, <clears throat> and then on the south and west sides, uh, the administration, uh, we, we can really kind of open up the building a little bit more. So the, the administration, administrative spaces and amenity programs, like uh, the office of the conference rooms, break rooms, cafes, those could all be established in uh, an open work environment. And you'll see as we, as we progress, uh, not only how we use health and wellness principles to guide this design, but also how we're to Lehigh's goals of, of creating a new interdisciplinary culture of collaboration, transparency, and, um, and accountability. So uh, now um, we can get into the, into the, the good stuff, uh, health and wellness. Our first design strategy is active community design which considers how different components of the building and site can encourage occupants to move more and reduce sedentary behavior. Physical inactivity is linked to chronic diseases, including type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and even depression and dementia. So active design focuses on introducing movement into everyday life to help mitigate those chronic diseases. At HST, active community design has been incorporated through prominent stairwells and adjustable desking within the building. The interdisciplinary research environment in itself helps to promote physical activity as occupants move around to collaborate with their colleagues. On the site level, uh, the site is pedestrian and cyclist focused with green spaces and pedestrian and cyclist only infrastructure. Next. Uh, so one of the one of the uh, approaches uh, early that we uh, sort of used early in design 
um, uh, was to, um, we love to sort of encourage uh, an active community uh, by promoting walking and to discourage the use of elevators. Uh, and the HST, uh, as you can see in the bottom right image uh, plan, uh, we, wanted, we did this by uh, locating elevators at sort of the far end of the building that are highlighted in yellow and kind of tucked them away, <clears throat> uh, away from the densely occupied areas that are more in the middle of the floor, floor plate. And then introducing um, a, a, a series of uh, communicating stairs uh, across the floor plate. You can sort of see those highlighted in red. Uh, the idea really being that, you know, any given person that might be sort of in the, in the labs or in the open uh, work area would need to pass you know, multiple stairways before getting to an elevator and hopefully would be motivated, uh, you know, to use stairs instead of, um, instead of taking the elevator. And once you do reach the elevator, there's signage at each elevator call area to encourage occupants to consider taking the stairs once more. Um, the signage was incorporated into the project as part of the Fitwell pursuit. The Center for Active Design cites research that signage at elevators can encourage occupants to consider taking the stairs. And it also aligned with the mission of the College of Health. In addition to the elevator signage, the College of Health also uh, was interested in implementing educational hand washing signage and no smoking signage. Um, so in, in these images here, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you get a sense of how the communicating stairs uh, in the spaces uh, function and feel. Um, there, um, in the in the left image, this, this section, you know, you can see they're they're integrated into the interior garden design uh, to make them, you know, inviting, uh, and they're placed within multi-story openings that provide visual connections between people on different floors, and this incentivizes interaction again, promoting. Um, the, the building the product goals of uh, increased collaboration. Uh, At the exterior of the site, HST was part of a broader campus shift from a car campus to a pedestrian focused campus. And the site itself is actually a, an existing parking lot. An interesting thing we discovered uh, while we were working on this project was finding out that the annual carbon emissions reduction from the new building is equivalent to removing all of the cars in the old parking lot from the road. The rest of the site also went through some major updates um, be to become more pedestrian and cyclist focused. Um, yeah, so one of, the, one of the big moves that we made here was along the, the Southern side of, of the building. Um, that it was, it's Acer Drive uh, and it's gonna be transformed uh, from what's now a, a high traffic uh, two-way service road uh, to a pedestrian friendly uh, Woolnerf space um, uh, with restricted, um, ac uh, restricted access um, to, uh, for vehicles. Uh, the traffic now will be one way from the east end only, uh, as you can see in the red arrow on, on the right image. Um, and then, uh, and that and that traffic from that from that end will um, will not be permitted beyond the HST and vertical loading docks highlighted with the red dash boxes. Part of the campus pedestrian initiative is a new master plan that moves campus parking to centralized lots off campus and also implements a more robust shuttle system. The goals of the master plan are to reduce the traffic congestion on and around campus, uh, reduce the road maintenance costs, and also help to cut the campus carbon emissions. The campus is already highly walkable um, and decently bikeable. The HST, HST's location has a walk score of 91 out of 100, which means that um, occupants are able to run daily errands without using a car. And the current location also has a bike score of 52 currently, meaning there is some bike infrastructure. As part of this project, we are encouraging bikeability by adding um, secured bike racks to the site and also showers for employees and graduates who choose to bike to the building. And this is part of Lehigh's broader uh, initiative of increasing bikeability on campus too. 
However, there is a big hill, so um, walking is still pretty encouraged. Next slide. And so the, these images um, are renderings uh, from various uh, vantage points, and they'll give you a sense of how the pedestrian experience um, will feel uh, within the HST landscape. Uh, the top right image is the Northeast uh, entryway, which we discussed a little bit earlier, and is, is, is Gabriella's background, uh, virtual background today. Um, and it represents that sort of large community functional space that, um, that uh, uh, Lehigh hopes to use to engage the community. Uh, the bottom left image is a view looking east down Asa Drive, uh, which was previously discussed, will become a, a pedestrian friendly curbless roadway integrated into, into, the, into the landscape. And then the lower right image is uh, our cafe terrace. Um, so we talk, and we'll, we'll talk more about um, terraces uh, in, in a little bit. Our second strategy at HST is incorporating biophilic design throughout the space. Incorporating natural elements into buildings can support occupant relief from stress and mental fatigue, and it can also help to increase attention. Biophilic design has also been linked to decreased levels of depression and anxiety and increased psychological well being. At HST, the three concepts of biophilic design were all implemented. There are elements of nature in the space where there is a direct visual connection to nature through both interior plants and natural light. There are natural analogs through biomorphic patterns and materials that mimic natural patterns that exist in nature. And there are also elements of nature of the space through dynamic views that overlook the campus, spaces of refuge, and senses of risk, for example, um, having glass rails with the stairwell design. Next slide. Uh, so now we'll, we'll take a, a, a look at how we sort of implemented um, biophilic, biophilic design into, into the project. And really biophilic can be introduced in a, into a design in a variety of ways, right? It can be, uh, it can be done literally as you see um, uh, in these images through the use of interior gardens and, and vegetative walls, but it can also be achieved more abstractly through um, the use of um, select colors, uh, lighting. Um, in, in the case of this project, uh, we are, we'll be using um, cross circadian controlled, li uh, circadian lighting uh, control system, um, and also through the use of, of natural materials. Uh, uh, like the wood ceiling you see in the right image uh, or, or the cellular shadow pattern you see on the floor uh, in, in the left image. On the, on the exterior, uh, we used um, a planted roof garden uh, at one of the conference, uh, a conference room roof decks. You can see that in the top left image. Uh, and, in the, and in the landscape, uh, we created this series of garden terraces as you can see in the in, in the bottom two images, so the um, uh, the uh, red the red pinkish squares that you see um, sort of surrounding the building are this series of terraces that step up across the landscape. With the dark wood one being the cafe plaza I mentioned uh, in in the previous uh, uh, rendering, uh, and this not only benefits um, I'm sorry, so um, this not only benefits. Um, those people within the gardens by providing them with a, a means to easily navigate, you know, uh, this, this hillside grade, but it also provides valuable biophilic viewing experience for the HST occupants within the building. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the sunscreen shadows uh, as a biophilic um, design piece uh, previously. Uh, the sunscreens on the HST are located on the, on the southern and west sides of the building. They're probably the most iconic architectural feature uh, of the HST. Um, but we wanted them to be more than just part of an architectural element. We wanted, uh, we wanted them to serve the project in, in, in ways meaningful to the sustainability goals. And we put a lot of time and effort into doing that. Uh, we, we use Grasshopper um, uh, with Revit to develop um, hundreds of different random um, patterns 
uh, of various different types, some organic, some more sort of mechanical. Uh, and, and, then, and then we sort of, once we narrowed those down, we, we, create, we started printing off 3D printed scale models. Um, you can see that in the, in the very top right image. And then as we narrowed them down even more, we started to build full scale models of what I would call the finalists. And we took those, we took those full scale models and we hung them up across all the southern windows um, of, our, of our office to try and get a feel for their impact on lighting and views. Uh, and then ultimately selecting the uh, organic pattern you see, you see in these images. Um, and note again on the desk in the top middle image, that, that shadow pattern. So watching that shadow pattern um, in our office just kind of morph across surfaces throughout the day really had the, sort of this calming and soothing effect. Uh, and you know, then from, from there, we, now we needed to sort of optimize this pattern. And uh, so we, we wanted to balance the cell size of the openness, the positive versus the negative. And the, the rendering the bottom right image gives you a sense of um, how we can ensure that there's a good balance between uh, our daylight goals, the views, the view goals, but also trying um, to make sure that we're getting solar performance out of the screen as well, which is um, you know, ultimately you know, what it was for. And we'll, uh, we'll cover that a little bit more uh, later. Our third strategy is designing for comfort. And comfort greatly influences our experiences in the places where we live and work. It's one of the highest contributing factors of human satisfaction with the building that they're in. Our comfort levels impact our mood, our motivation, and our focus. At HST, we addressed occupant comfort through flexible desking, daylighting with glare control, views to nature, thermal comfort, and access to private spaces. Next slide. So, um, a, a lot of consideration to occupant comfort uh, went into the design of the HST. Uh, ergonomics, you know, in workspace design is is by no means a new concept, um, but it's not commonplace among the high data research facilities. Uh, and the open workspace environment we wanted to achieve was certainly not common within academic institutions. But it really was necessary to achieve uh, project goals. Um, uh, project goals of, of forward thinking, collaborative uh, spaces and, and, and sustainability. Um, so for HST, we, uh, we pursued a corporate workspace model. Uh, the, the new Dean from the College of Health was um, previously um, uh, uh, came from, a, from a, a corporate environment. So she uh, liked the idea and was on board with it. Um, and so ultimately we took, you know, we created uh, a, a, a series of, of large, uh, of, of different types of workspace. So large and small conference rooms, uh, breakout rooms that might support, you know, a group of four or five, uh, phone booths uh, for individual um, video conferences or telephone calls. And those are, so, so those spaces are sort of highlighted in the green. Uh, and then, um, we also wanted a mix of furniture uh, seating uh, options. And so those are highlighted in the red squares and you see traditional desking, um, right? Uh, and we also use um, a mix of high top uh, and picnic type tables and then individual and group soft seating um, uh, um, furnishings. Uh, and actually we're able to achieve a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, fixed desking uh, to, to soft seating or alternative seating. So th um, there's always um, a place for, uh, for, for someone to find a seat. Uh, the exterior, the other unique thing about the, this condition is the exterior wall edges. They belong, so they belong to the occupant, the occupant community as a whole. Um, private offices that uh, tradi are traditionally located along exterior walls have been moved inboard. Um, this is uh, particularly unusual uh, in academic environments. But then we use those um, office pods that we created to define sort of neighborhoods uh, within, the, within the space. So you know, as faculty are assigned and they bring their research groups with them, they'll be able to sort of break up into, um, into the appropriate groups um, while my maintaining sort of a sense of identity uh, within, a, within a large open floor play. 
<clears throat> and then um, with regards to desking, uh, Gabriella sort of touched on it a bit in the introduction. Uh, you know, traditional desking is is also provided. Uh, and there's a mix of sizes, uh, and, and but the the um, the design uh, includes uh, desking, uh, so that all desking is individually height adjustable. And some of the some renderings in the top left, uh, uh, and then uh, you know, some uh, photograph of the the uh, proposed system that we are hoping to procure. Um, and then desking uh, in highlighted in the green area. I'm sorry, in the um, in the red areas uh, are also reconfigurable, so they can be uh, not only height adjustable, but they can be sort of demounted from their uh, power and tell data infrastructure systems to allow students to sort of reconfigure them into different groups or into um, you know any sort of configuration that best serves their their um, their study needs. Uh, and then along the edge of the public corridors, uh, highlighted in green, um, we used uh, in, in lieu of using walls, we created we created a fixed uh, a fixed uh, desking system. Still height adjustable, but um, it, by by using the desking to create the edge, uh, this sort of minimizes um, walls and allows uh, allows us the use of um, full height glass when walls are needed, and, and that helps us to achieve um, you know natural light deep into the floor plate. And and Gabriella will talk talk a little bit more about um, our daylighting analysis. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I jumped, I spoke ahead of slides. So this, this gives you a sense of the spaces internally. So you can see exterior glass, interior glass, minimal walls, and really trying to create an open uh, transparent environment. The bottom right image, you see that, that office space that is, um, uh, those are faculty offices that are all glass. Again, promoting um, accountability and um, uh, transparency and, and, and um, collaborative uh, type environments. We pursued a daylight analysis in accordance with LEED version 4.1 requirements, the daylight credit. And uh, overall, we achieved 44% spatial daylight autonomy for regularly occupied spaces, meaning that 44% of regularly occupied area achieves 300 lux for at least half of daylight hours. 300 lux is about the levels where an occupant could perform a task without additional lighting. Because this building is built into a hue, a, a hue, excuse me, a hill, our overall calc is skewed. Um, the lower floor, the, the lowest floor has a lower overall spatial daylight autonomy, but all of the upper floors actually receive 50 plus percent spatial daylight autonomy. Uh, LEED quantifi quantifies glare through ASE, which is annual sunlight exposure. And our analysis shows 23.6% of regularly occupied space would have um, a level of 1000 lux for 250 hours annually. To help mitigate that, there is shading in all regularly occupied spaces and the sunscreen actually also helps to mitigate the glare. The graphic at the bottom of the screen shows the result of a glare study that was conducted for multiple sunscreen patterns. The x-axis shows months and the y-axis shows time of day. Areas in green represent all times of the year where there's imperceptible glare with a daylight glare probability of less than 0.35. And areas in red show the time of year where there is intolerable glare with a daylight glare probability of over 0.45. So um, this, this specifically shows the sunscreen pattern that was chosen. And with this selection, there are some glare issues between 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, for three months of the year. Uh, <clears throat> the open work area uh, air, uh, concept of sort of also allowed us to maximize views to the exterior in addition to um, great uh, daylight opportunities. 
the extensive use of both uh, interior and exterior glazing allowed us to achieve views across the entire floor plate. So in the, in the top left image uh, is a view of, um, imagine standing at the south wall and from there that, you know, one per that person can see across the desking through a conference room and then on through the labs on the north side of the building and then right out the, the north side windows. Um, you, can see, you can see more of this in the bottom left image uh, where views of the uh, exterior are, are achieved, not only from within this farm space, um, but also from the corridor uh, at the left side, which has a glass wall, and from the conference room uh, at, at, at the back um, on the floor above, which also has a glass wall. So this, again, is allowing daylight in and allowing us to get views uh, to the gardens out. The, the blue arrows you see in the, in, in the bottom right image um, are indicative of our primary um, uh, public corridors. And uh, <clears throat> each end of both of these corridors is again terminated with windows. Uh, so you're maintaining uh, views to the exterior even, even when Trish, uh, traveling up and down corridors. We also conducted a views analysis under version 4.1 of LEED um, for the views credit, the quality views credit. And overall, uh, HST received a 65.4% regularly occupied spaces with views. Per LEED criteria, um, to count for LEED, you have to meet two view types. Uh, one that we considered was views of flora, fauna, and sky, in addition to movement with people um, moving around campus. And then the second view type um, was views within three times the head height of windows with no permanent interior obstructions. We were able to um, demonstrate views for many of the regularly occupied spaces within the building due to the lack of permanent interior obstructions in the space. And similar, similarly to the daylight credit, because this building is built on a hill, the lower floors skewed our overall calculation and 75% uh, plus of regularly occupied spaces on the upper floors do um, meet the 75% views criteria. The HVAC system at HST uh, was chosen to optimize energy performance in an energy intense lab environment, while also prioritizing thermal comfort for occupants. So the HVAC system at HST uses neutral temperature air delivered through chilled beams, which provides a more uniform thermal environment throughout the space. The chilled beams are paired with perimeter radiant heat to counteract thermal asymmetry at the perimeter. So what this means for occupants is that occupants toward the, perim toward the core of the space, like our researcher on the left with the microscope, and occupants um, toward the perimeter of the space, like our presenter, um, experience the same thermal environment. In addition to that uniform thermal environment throughout the space, there are thermostats throughout the building that allow occupants to control the temperature of their space. And additionally, the sunscreen um, also acts to reduce heat gain. The beneficial shading provided by the sunscreen was evaluated for multiple pattern options and configuration options. The graphic on the lower right-hand part of the screen shows the panel design um, or the impact of panel design on solar radiation at the west facade of the building. The y-axis shows KBTU per square foot and the x-axis shows the various screen patterns and screen orientations evaluated. So there, the three orientations are um, perpendicular screens that are two feet and nine inches wide uh, screens that are perpendicular to the facade and five feet and six inches wide. And the last three are screens that are parallel oh, to the facade. Oh, okay. And um, the, so ultimately, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. sorry, I think we have someone um, not on mute. Okay. Um, the, on the far left shows the, um, 
shows a no shading situation. So in um, blue is represents beneficial shading and yellow represents beneficial solar radiation. Ultimately, the um, perpendicular orientation with panels that were two feet and nine inches wide was chosen because we were able to get benefits from shading while also maintaining, maintaining view corridors and um, daylight along the west facade. And then just, just to clarify quickly, the, that's the, uh, uh, the two foot nine is the spacing between yes. uh, the um, panels, not the width of the panels. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, no problem. Great. And the final occupant comfort measure that we implemented on site was to provide private spaces where occupants could take refuge during a busy work day. These spaces included a mother's room where new mothers can pump in a comfortable private space and a meditation room where occupants could go for relaxation, to pray or meditate, or to simply have a private moment. To help promote a sense of refuge in these spaces, the ceilings are two feet lower than the ceilings in the rest of the building. And these private spaces are really important for occupant comfort because it can help occupants to feel supported and cared for and might help to reduce some of the stress of new parenthood or everyday life. And um, in addition to the mere inclusion of these rooms in the program uh, and the benefits that come along with, with those, um, each has been outfitted uh, with supporting infrastructure to really maximize those uh, their benefits, right? Uh, the lack room, for example, has uh, a, a sink. It has, it includes a microwave and an unaccounted refrigerator for bottle prep, cleaning, and storage. And in the meditation room, um, uh, the meditation will include HEPA filtering on the exhaust air return uh, to uh, help eliminate the permeation of odors associated uh, with um, potential ceremonial burning of uh, incense or, or other herbs. Our fourth strategy is clean air and water. And overall, HST implemented strong ventilation and filtration systems to provide enhanced air and water quality to occupants. Um, and also the university has committed to ongoing operational procedures to maintain air and water quality. Next slide. Lehigh has committed to annual air and water testing at HST as part of the Fitwell pursuit. Annual air testing will include testing for particulate matter, TVOCs, carbon dioxide and monoxide, and formaldehyde. And water testing will be conduct conducted at all drinking water locations for arsenic, lead, legionella, and other contaminants. Additionally, we have interior gardens inside the building that will help filter air. There's also accessible drinking water with fountains and water bottle filling stations on every floor within 100 feet of regularly occupied spaces. And lastly, Lehigh has committed to ensuring ongoing indoor air quality by implementing green cleaning and integrated pest management policies to reduce occupant exposure to harmful chemicals and uh, harmful chemicals from cleaning products and pesticides. Uh, so that leads us into um, our last topic of discussion, uh, which is stakeholder buy-in. Um, stakeholder buy-in uh, will be key to the success of our health and wellness goals uh, for the HST. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pro, uh, one of the project goals is to drive a real cultural shift at Lehigh. And this is really no small task for any institution. So to be successful, um, Lehigh uh, is gonna face uh, many challenges. And some of those are, are black and white, such as uh, policy changes, um, and at which we will touch on a little bit more. Um, and, and, and while others are more int intangible, um, like uh, culture and commitment. Uh, and this is why the stakeholder buying is, is absolutely critical when you're trying to make these kinds of, um, try these kinds of changes uh, on, on a, at an institution. Um, this shot is uh, from one of our design workshops uh, with stakeholder group. Uh, among them, 
our, our, you know, our the university president, uh, campus architect, the provost uh, and faculty deans, maintenance and operations staff, uh, as well as EHS and the sustainability rep, uh, representative, uh, among others. Uh, it, it really takes a unified commitment by this group um, as a whole to, to really drive change. As part of the as part of the Fitwell pursuit, we um, worked with Lehigh to implement multiple building level policies. I know that we are approaching our time, so I'm not going to go into much depth on these policies. But we implemented an indoor air quality policy, uh, green cleaning and pest management policies, and an, an emergency preparedness policy. The conversations around these building level policies at HST actually ended up driving changes in campus policies. Next slide. So the Fitwell Pursuit brought about the discussion of how some campus policies should be updated to align with the university's overall sustainability and wellness goals. And through the policy process, we identified three campus-wide initiatives that could be addressed in conjunction with HST's Fitwell pursuit. These policies were a campus-wide no smoking policy that many at Lehigh have been advocating for for some time a revisitation of the sustainable purchasing policy, which currently or previously provided general but not specific guidelines for sustainable procurement, and the opportunity for HST to contribute to the new centralized parking initiative. There's also a healthy food and beverage, or there's also a cafe on site that has implemented a healthy beverage and food policy which includes incentivizing healthy eating through price reductions of healthy food and requires the cafe to follow nutritional and food safety requirements in accordance with Fitwell's guidelines. And in addition to the healthy food and beverage selections, the space also has many of the other health and wellness qualities found throughout the building, including the views, daylight and uh, uh, biophilia. Uh, and access to garden, uh, direct access to the terrace gardens. And interestingly, we're working with the food service vendor right now, finalizing their needs for the space. And I recently learned that they're installing a sort of robotic salad machine that will build customized salads. And this type of technology better preserves ingredients uh, and eliminates uh, some of the sanitary risks that are associated with uh, traditional salad bars. As the project is preparing for opening in the fall, we're meeting quarterly with Lehigh stakeholders to work on ongoing College of Health programming that will take place weekly. Uh, some of the events that are in consideration are yoga and meditation classes and nutrition and mental health seminars. Additionally, we're working with the College of Health Lehigh Environmental Health and Safety and the food service vendor to establish an ongoing stakeholder collaboration process to ensure an ongoing commitment to health, welfare, and safety of the building occupants. And um, so obviously, you know, we're, we're very hopeful the goals, challenges, and ideas presented here today speak to a level of commitment put forth by the entire project team to the success of HST. Uh, to close, we thought we would share just a, a few instances uh, where we believe Lehigh pushed themselves even further, um, you know, with perhaps some, some coaxing from the AE team uh, to really maximize the health and wellness opportunities uh, for the HST and for the campus. As we went through the Fitwell pursuit with Lehigh stakeholders, the building truly became a catalyst for broader health and wellness initiatives on campus. Currently, Lehigh stakeholders are using HST's Fitwell pursuit to push through the campus-wide no smoking policy. We also worked with the sustainability office and facilities teams to update the sustainable purchasing policy with concrete procurement guidelines. And last, as a new visual gateway to campus, HST is able to promote the transition to a pedestrian campus visually to the broader public. And then a couple of other uh, sort of quick anecdotes, um, you know, understanding the value that plants and vegetation uh, offer in terms of, of uh, beauty and health and wellness, 
HGA introduced ideas, the ideas of interior gardens and a vegetative wall, sort of early in the design process. Sadly, we got to uh, we got a good deal of pushback uh, from some folks at Lehigh due to their associated maintenance costs and some failed experience that, that uh, experiences at other campus buildings. Uh, and both came very close uh, to being eliminated from the project. Fortunately, uh, as the home for the new College of Health, uh, the Dean felt it was imperative for the gardens to remain in the design. So she and her group actually committed to take on stewardship of the gardens and accepted responsibility for their maintenance under the umbrella of the College of Health. And, and similarly, uh, in another example of Kermit Lehigh sustainability group, felt compelled to ensure that, um, that the vegetative wall remained in the project. And so they went forth and implemented a fundraising campaign to uh, pay, both pay for the procurement and installation. And our last story of commitment is Lehigh's increased commitment to sustainability and health and wellness mm -hmm. throughout this project. At the early stages of the project, the RFP listed requirements for LEED Silver certification and did not mention health and wellness goals. As a design team, we incorporated health and wellness concepts from Well and Fit Well early in the project, even though the building was not pursuing these certifications. And these ideas resonated with Lehigh, as Scott said, right from the beginning and became a core focus for all involved in the project. From there, we were really able to take health and wellness to the next level when we found an advocate in the new College of Health Dean. With their buy-in, the project decided to pursue the third-party FitWell certification, and the policies and some fundraising efforts um, came from that, from that buy-in. And to add to that, on top of pursuing FitWell, we were able to incorporate these elements of health and wellness design into our LEED certification for credit. Um, we are able to achieve the daylight credit and are also getting innovation points for active design and biophilic design. And those were some of the strategies that we were able to use to get from the original LEED silver target to now a LEED gold target. Uh, that's, uh, that's the presentation. Thank you uh, to everyone who attended and again to the BSA and Scott for uh, having us um, and also to uh, Lehigh for putting their trust uh, in, in partnering with HGA and Grand Weil and, and the rest of our uh, consultant team. Thank you both. Uh, great presentation, uh, a great inspiring project um, of, of a building that really kind of takes the idea of health and wellness design and weaves it through every, every part of the design and, and the operation of the building, the buy-in from the campus, um, really to, to help ensure that the, the experience that the occupants of this building have for years and years to come um, you know, reflects the, the intent of the design and, and the college. Um, we have relatively limited uh, time for Q and A, uh, and so um, I, I do want to, uh, you know, I think uh, there was a question in the in the chat um, from Paula about the types of greenery um, and plants that were inside the building and the H two O for them. Um, one interesting uh, thing that, you know, it wasn't really a health and wellness strategy, but it was a sustainability strategy, um, was that the project uh, incorporated a reclaimed water system using roof rainwater and HVAC condensate. A lab building has a lot of condensate um, from dehumidifying the air. And uh, that is actually the source of the water for um, the irrigation of the interior planters and the um, the, the planters and landscaping around the building. Um, so uh, beyond that, you know, I think the team, uh, there's a question about the glare control, um, I, which I think that they provided, but um, are there other other opportunities or, or options for uh, active glare control with uh, manual shades, things like that incorporated into the design too? Um, so the, the, the Gabriella mentioned that the we do have a physical uh, shade uh, shading system um, for all the windows, including the curtain wall systems. The those those in the open work area, we have the large expanses of curtain wall are are motorized, and um, so they can be 
all sort of controlled as a group uh, and they could potentially be put on a um, timer system um, that's not currently in the project. So that would be a way to sort of implement that. Interestingly, um, I've also been in discussions with uh, uh, the work, uh, workplace group at HGA because um, we've, we have the, several issues have come up with regards to the open work environment, not only uh, glare control at the workstations, um, that, you know, and I'm thinking relative to the actual uh, screens, but also um, uh, security at those workstations and how people's uh, PCs and, and personal belongings and other things are, are protected. So we're looking at various options. Uh, you know, it's easy to put your laptop in a locked drawer, a locker that are available um, within the building. But the bigger concern was if I just get up from my desk for five minutes to go get coffee, I don't want to have to pack my laptop up and, and lock it away. So those are the, uh, some, some of the things that we are looking at a little deeply uh, uh, more into. Well, thank you. Um, I want to give Debbie a few moments to, to wrap things up on behalf of BSA SCUP. But um, again, I want to thank uh, both Scott and Gabriella for a great presentation um, and kind of showing us and inspiring us all with um, the great work that you've done. And I want to remind everyone in the audience, if you have not already filled out the form in the chat uh, to get your continuing education credit, which by the way, Scott mentioned, this is also eligible for an HSW credit for um, those of you uh, looking for those. And with that, I'll hand it over to Debbie to wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I think everybody who stuck with us the whole day should get a certificate. Um, but it was a, a great program. When we sat down with the BSA um, uh, SCUP group and we thought of healthy buildings, uh, it was funny because uh, the initial conversation was about mental health, health well being, and other people were talking about engineering. And then we thought, why not? I mean, it's a big topic. And so we hope that you enjoyed the multi dimensional aspect of this. Thank you, Patrick, for, for moderating uh, with me. Uh, on behalf of my co-chairs, Donna Denayo and Nyusha Arndt, I want to thank all the presenters, uh, Diana Anderson, Paula Buick, Pat Duffy, Brian Ridingsward, Gabrielle Henkels, and Scott Lugo. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, S Susan Green at the BSA. Um, this will be recorded, so if you want to share it with your colleagues, um, you can look on the BSA, SCUP, uh, BSA website and find that. Uh, we do have upcoming BSA SCUP roundtables for folks who are interested on campus community from a student life perspective, faculty workspaces, net zero programs on campus, the future of learning, ideas for outdoor environments, and equity, diversion, and inclusion. We try to tackle all of the important uh, topics, and uh, we're pretty excited about uh, giving you this kind of program. It is an extension of the SCUP and the North Atlantic SCUP uh, program offerings. And I want to call your attention to an absolutely wonderful conference coming up uh, for the North Atlantic region on March 17th to 19th after the fall, reimagining the future. And again, it's forward looking like we're trying to do here. Edie Weiner, a futurist, will be joining. Catherine Newman, who is the Chancellor for Academic Programming at UMass. Um, and then there will be a president's panel hosted or moderated by Deirdre Fernandez. Um, I still get the paper in my house in the morning because my husband likes to read the sports page. And I started noticing that Deirdre Fernandez had articles above the fold on the front page of the globe on higher education. And it got me very excited about engaging her. So she is going to be uh, moderating a president's panel. And so thank you all for joining. Uh, do plan to join more if, if the topics interest you. Do look at the um, SCUP website for the upcoming uh, North Atlantic SCUP conference. And thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you all. Nice to meet you virtually.